<clears throat> Father, we thank you for this another opportunity to minister to these, your precious sheep. Thank you, Lord, that revelation knowledge will flow freely, uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. And Father, I pray that you will speak through my vocal cords and think through my mind, Lord. None of me, all of you, do something in us today that, that can never be replaced. And we bless you for it now. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of St. John, chapter 16 verse 13 through 14. I have, uh, I put this message off for months for several reasons. Number one, sometimes when things are so simple, I kind of, I get concerned that it, it will go over people's head. Number two, I needed to make sure that I was prepared to preach something like this, that I was prepared to receive it. And then thirdly, the right time. <laughs> and it was definitely the right time that I wrote it months ago because I, I, I didn't have use of one of my fingers this past week, so <laughs> that was some ugly writing that came out, you know. But I need you to listen to this with your heart. I'm going to talk to you about Christ, the preeminent one. Christ, the preeminent one. When, when something is preeminent, it's the strongest, it's the most important, it's the most powerful. When something is preeminent, it towers above any and everything else. What happens in the life of a Christian when Christ becomes greater than anything else, greater than anybody else? What happens when your relationship with him towers above any and everything else? He knows how to get you where you want to be, or should I say where we need to be. But it is not going to be through intellect alone. This is not going to take place because of how well you can dissect a scripture. Listen to me carefully. This, we're going too far with this. You're, it, it's important to intellectually be able to understand the Word of God. But that's not the bulk of this. The bulk of this is to know Him versus knowing about Him and able to articulate Him to know Him. There was a time where men followed God and they didn't have this thing, this instrument we have today called the Bible. But they knew him. And today we have this instrument of the Bible and we know about him. And, and, and because of, of this, which I don't deny, I praise God for this. This is my foundation for everything. But I am saying it is not just this by itself. There is a portion of it that requires you to know him so that you won't marry the mechanics. And by marrying the mechanics, you judge everybody's whose mechanics are different than yours. But when you know him, 
All the things that you're intellectualizing cannot accomplish can be accomplished because you simply know him, not just about him, you feel him, you sense him, you know him. I don't want to get to heaven and ask Jesus to sit down while I show him everything I know. I want to get to heaven and make sure I don't walk past him because I know him. So I want you to follow me very carefully here because in this, there's a lot of things that came together for me. The story of, of, of Abraham's oldest servant going to find his son, a wife, Rebecca. What was that all about? It was a shadow of something. Now I know. The scriptures that talk about the Holy Spirit's job was to magnify Jesus and give him glory. I didn't quite understand that. I, 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 now I know. And all that I have learned and known from these scriptures has driven me to want to know him better. And I pray that that happens to you today, that you know him better. Glory to God. St. John chapter 16, verse 13 and 14, he said, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he, the spirit of truth, will guide you into all truth. For, and he, here's a part of the truth, for he shall not speak of himself. The Holy Spirit is not speaking of himself. But whatsoever he, the Holy Spirit, shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come based on what he hears. Verse 14. He shall glorify me. Now, Jesus is speaking here. He shall glorify me. Underline that. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and then he's going to show what's mine unto you. And he says, by him receiving from Jesus and showing it to you, he gives glory to Jesus. And I want to know what is it that he's going to show me that's going to give glory to Jesus. Not just go around and say, well, the Holy Ghost is going to show, and then you fill in the blank with all these weird things. But he's telling you here, he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, he shall show it unto you. So the work of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Christ. Oh, that sounds so Christian-like. Oh, that sounds so religious, that he's going to glorify Christ. I couldn't stop there, and months and months went by, and I'm like, I, what do you mean by glorifying him? What do you mean by glorifying him? I don't want to just use another Christian word. What does that mean? What does that look like? The work of the Holy Spirit is to glorify Christ. And if the work of the Holy Spirit is to glorify or to magnify Christ, then it follows that it is God's purpose that the believer shall see the fullness of the beauty in him because he says he's going to glorify me and he shall show it unto you. So the believer is going to see something. Let's, let's look at this. What is it, what, let's answer that question. What does it mean to, to glorify God? It means to acknowledge his greatness and his splendor. The Holy Spirit's job is to acknowledge the greatness, the splendor, the awesomeness, the grace, the mercy. And I realized, oh, I have seen it. What have I seen? I have seen the greatness and the splendor of, of the grace of God working in my life, tearing out that shame and guilt and pain, taking you 
and completely turning you around and you're still trying to figure out how did I get where I am right now? I was such a fool. And now all I want is Jesus. How did that happen? The Holy Spirit says, I'm glorifying him because I've received of him and I am showing you his greatness. Oh, look how great he was when he saved you from that addiction. Oh, look how awesome he was when he healed you. Oh, look how amazing he was when he gave you something you didn't deserve. Oh, look out. Look at the splendor of him giving you peace. And now you went from two hours to sleep to seven hours of sleep. I see his glory. So, so when the mind of a man and when the heart of a man, when it becomes occupied with Christ, think, think, think with me. When your mind becomes occupied with Christ, when your heart becomes occupied with Christ, I don't, I can't speak for anybody in here. I don't know what your mind's occupied with. I don't know what your heart's occupied with, but if it's not Christ, we got an issue here. Because when your mind and heart becomes occupied with Christ, then the grace and the truth of which he is full of, John chapter 1, 14, Jesus full of what? Grace and what? Truth. The grace and the truth which he is full of, Jesus is full of, must become a great influence for godly living. The grace and truth that Jesus is full of must become an influence for godly living. Not the fact that you know all the laws and then you work hard to keep all the rules, but the grace and the truth of Jesus has so influenced you that godly living springs up in your life because of the influence. And you're no longer looking to see how to keep that commandment, that commandment, how to do this, how to do that, how to love, how to forgive, how to do all those things, but you're so influenced by him. His glory has been shown to you. His grace and, and truth has been made real to you, and your mind is occupied with his grace. Your mind is occupied with his truth. It is no longer just what you get on Sunday, but Monday you're occupied with this grace and truth, and, and Tuesday you're occupied with this grace and truth because all your Christian life you've been trying to arrive at a certain point, and you never got there, but something happened when you submitted yourself to depend on on this grace and truth, and now you look at yourself now and you're just not what you used to be. Now, on the other hand, when a believer struggles in self-effort to do that which he thinks is right, your mind then becomes occupied with self and your soul is drawn away from Christ because you're just thinking about how I can do this. How can I do that? How can I do that? How can I be successful? How can I get enough money to do this? How can I do that? How can I forgive this? How, your, your mind is occupied with self and you're struggling in your self-effort. And for some people, they don't even know that the struggle is in their self-effort. And for most Christians, they don't know that even coming to church, you leave with your mind occupied with your self-effort. How am I going to forgive? How am I going to walk in love? How am I going to do this? And you're trying to come up with a strategy in self-effort to try to accomplish something, and you don't even realize that your soul is drawn away from Christ because you're so occupied with how you going to do it. Therefore, when the Holy Spirit takes of the things that are Christ and he shows them to the believer, he is now carrying out God's purpose of the teaching by grace. 
He's showing you, oh, I mean, are you kidding me? He is showing you that you're righteous even though you ain't there all the way yet. He is, he's, he's disrupting a desire that has plagued you all your life. And one day you woke up and that, the strength of that desire begins to be depleted. And one day you realize, I don't even desire that anymore. Anybody know what I'm talking about here? How? How did I get here? You remember those days where you heard something at church, you heard something about this, and you knew it was right, and so you accepted the challenge, and you went home and wrote some formulas down, some plans down, and you said you were going to do it every day. You started off right with the right heart, but it didn't last for two days. <laughs> and then the fourth day, you forgot all about it. <laughs> and all God wanted you to do is can you spend some time with me? Can we talk today? You ain't even got to pray a form of prayer of the rules you learned about prayer at church. Can we just talk? In fact, if you want to, you could just be quiet and I'll fill you with my presence. And you look up and he has worked on a desire and taken away a desire and even gave you a new one. And the struggle you had with loving that person is not a struggle anymore. I, I've been hanging around the essence of pure love and it has rubbed off in me and on me and I can't explain intellectually to you what has happened, but I can love now. I can love stuff that's not lovely, that I don't need it to be lovely for me to love because of the Holy Spirit on the inside of me, pouring the love of God on the inside of me, revealing to me Jesus and seeing this part of his greatness and his awesomeness. I don't need you to be all right for me to love you because now I've made room for your faults because the Holy Ghost has shown me my own. <sighs> and you find that you have willingly left all and you hunger for That's why I am right now. I had three friends that went home to be with the Lord last week. And I'm not trying to get all my legalism together so I can plead my case before the Lord. If I had one more week, and believe me, I got a whole lot more than one more week, what would I want? I want to know him. Yes, sir. I don't want to be caught going to heaven knowing how to do church, but doing church never taught me how to do life. Oh, God. How can I separate myself from my bad tradition? How can I separate myself from my self-effort? How many fables have I created and told myself it must be true? 
Genesis chapter 24 gives an illustration here of, of something that I, I saw. Flip over there. Genesis 24, I, I looked at this thing and I was like, Lord, I don't think I've ever seen this like this before. The Holy Spirit showing you things about him. So this is a story here about Abraham who was old. Sarah had just died. He called his older servant to go and seek out a wife for his son, Isaac. Verse 10, and the servant took 10 camels of of camels of his masters and departed for all the goods of his master were in his hands. He arose and went to Mesopotamia and to the city of Nahar. Nahor. So he takes 10 camels, he takes a lot of the goods that Abram had. What is he going to do with this? Verse 22, and it came to pass as the camels had done drinking that the man took a golden earring of half a shickle weight two braces for her hands, and of ten shekels weight of gold. Abraham had already prophesied to him exactly how this was going to go down. She was going to show up. She was going to have a bucket in her hands when she do, do this and do that. And so in verse 33, I wish I could read the whole thing, but I don't, I'm skipping around. Verse 33, he says, I will not eat until I have told mine Aaron. And he said, speak on. And he said, I am Abraham's servant. And the Lord hath blessed my master greatly, and he has become great. And he has given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and men servants and maid servants and camels and asses. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old, and unto him hath he given all that he had. See, right now, this servant is glorifying Abraham and his master, and Isaac. And he said, verse 39, And I said unto my master, Peradventure the woman would not follow me. And he said unto me, The Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with thee, and he'll prosper your, your way. And thou shalt take a wife for my son of my kindred and of my father's house. So he went to his kinfolks to find a wife. That was not so weird back then. It'd be weird now. Gross Amona. Verse 41, then shalt thou be clear from this my oath when thou comest to my kindred, and if I give not thee one, thou shalt be clear from thy, my oath. And I came this day unto the well and said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, if thou do prosper my way which I go, behold, I stand by the well of water. It shall come to pass that when the virgin cometh forth to draw water, and I say to her, Give me, I pray thee a little water of thy pitcher to drink. And she say to me, Both drink thou, and I'll also draw for thy camels. Let the same be the woman whom the Lord has appointed out of my master's son. Look at the glory that's being given for all the things that happened before he arrived. <clears throat> And then, verse 49, And now, if you will deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me. If not, tell me that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. And then Laban, Bethulam answered and said, The thing proceeded from the Lord. We cannot speak unto thee bad or good. He said, Behold, Rebekah is before thee. Take her. Go. Let her be thy master's son's wife, as the Lord has spoken. And they worshiped him. Verse 53, and the servant brought forth jewels of silver, jewels of gold, raiment, and gave to Rebekah. And he gave also to her brother and to her mother precious things. What was happening here? It was by presenting gifts from Isaac through the servant and telling about him that Abraham's servant attracted the heart of Rebekah. Her heart was attracted from what she heard about him and the things that was given to her. 
and she went with him and she became Isaac's bride because of what she heard and what she saw and her heart was attracted towards him. So also the Holy Spirit by glorifying Christ seeks to draw believers away from the things of the world and to bring them to Christ. The Holy Spirit says, what I want to do is I want to show you he can change you. I want to show you he can give you peace. I want to show you there's mercy for the bad you deserve you don't get. Soon as you did something stupid and thought you were going to get punished for it and the goodness showed up instead of the punishment, I want that to attract your heart to leave the world, to leave what you were doing and come to him because I have shown you the beauty of his glory. So also the Holy Spirit, by glorifying Christ, seeks to draw believers away from the things of the world and bring them to Christ. You don't think your testimony is important? We can help glorify Christ. You need to start telling somebody, I used to be like this, but let me show you his beauty. Look at what he has done. I used to be on drugs, messed up. Let me show you. See, we're we too embarrassed to try to, to you don't want to tell nobody where you've been. I'm telling you, the only reason you are not there anymore is so we can use that to glorify Christ so we can bring people out of their mess through the beauty of what they see in our lives. Don't you be afraid to tell somebody you used to be a crook, you used to be on drugs, you used to be a manipulator and a liar. Let somebody know because by, by pure chance, you're probably talking to somebody who already know because God a lot of times will send you to somebody just like you. Show them the beauty of his majesty. The Holy Spirit never leads anyone to look at himself and his own accomplishments, but only and always at Christ and what he has done. What has Christ done in you? Huh. You know it was him. You tried it for years and nothing never happened. Well, you see, this before I went to church. No, 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 no. God didn't, God's not waiting until you get to church. He will meet you in the bar you got drunk at last night. And when you wake up, there might be something different about you. But if it is, you can't take the credit for that. That's something that the Spirit of God is revealing to you, a merciful God, a gracious God, a God who can clean you up and call you while you're intoxicated and to let you know when you clean up that it wasn't a dream. It's true. He still wants to use you. He used three murderers. Why wouldn't he want to use you? Think about all the regrets you have in your life. Think about all the mess-ups you had in your life. And I'm not speaking to you from just the point of, well, before you got saved. Now I'm talking to a lot of you after you got saved. Some of the biggest hell and sinning took place after you made Jesus the Lord of your life, and the shame came into your life, and the guilt came into your life. I'm telling you right now, we have got to get rid of this little fable thing and stop being afraid of letting people know, look at Christ in me. Because sometimes when they're not, they're not understanding what I'm preaching and they're not understanding the Bible you gave them, they can understand a living epistle that will tell them, I used to be here, but look at where God has brought me right now. What are you afraid of? I'm, I'm over this playing church phony kind of stuff. I can't even do that. I can't even do that. If y'all want to play some church and, and do some fable stuff and stuff like that, I got to go. I'll have my resignation info tonight. I got to go. I ain't got time to do that. 
this thing is getting real. I don't want to talk to you or debate to you about some intellectual aerobics that you had about a particular scripture. Oh, I got revelation. Well, good. He revealed it to who? You. Well, you, you did do it. Don't talk to me about it. He revealed it to you. He didn't reveal it to me. I ain't supposed to know what you're trying to tell me right now. I might not be ready for what you're trying to tell me right now. Y'all ain't ready for me today. Some of y'all looking at me like... Paul expressed to the believers of Ephesus his desire and prayer on their behalf. And here's what Paul said to them. Look at Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 and 19 in the King James. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 and 19. He said, that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Here's what I want. I want Christ to dwell in your hearts. I want Christ to dwell in my heart. Does, does Christ dwell in your heart? Do you feel him? Do you sense him? Somebody say, well, you're not moved by your feelings. No, he wants you to feel his love. Even though you can't comprehend it all, he still wants you to feel it and sense it and experience his love with your deep self. You ain't supposed to feel it. He wants you to experience his love. that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being, watch this, he wants you to be rooted and grounded, what? In love. Then may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, and to know and to know and to know, not know about, but to know, to know. This has to come with experience, and to know. This is something you have to know because you're experien experientially, and to know the love of Christ, not to know about the love of Christ, not to tell me what well, that means, agape, and you know you got uh, phileo, and you got eros, ah, no, 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 no. To know his love, to know his love when you didn't have no money to pay your light bill, to know his love when you were hurt and diagnosed with some kind of bad cancer, to know his love, not know about it. Yeah. To know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. Woo. So he says, this passes knowledge, so quit trying to know it intellectually. He said, the only way you're going to know this is you got to know it experience, experientially that you might be filled just by knowing and experiencing his love, you get full of God. You get full of God just by knowing and experiencing his love. Look at this in the uh, NLT, go back to verse 17. Just by knowing his love. Do you, you know how full of God you get when, when you experience God's love? Oh, there's nothing like it when the goodness showed up and you didn't deserve it. You're full of God because you've experienced his love. Now, am I throwing away the intellectual part? I told you at the beginning. I'm not throwing away the intellectual part, but don't make that part the whole. It's that plus the experience. In fact, why know about something intellectually and never experience. That's hypocrisy. Why well, know about it intellectually and never know it? Don't you just love those people that always tell you about what they know and ain't experienced nothing? <laughs> it's like an analyst who wants to talk about football and how you ought to do it, and he ain't never played. Well, he could have made that tackle. Yeah, but he just ran 50 yards and had to run back again, and he tied. <laughs> well, he should have made that tackle. Yeah, but when he hit the guy, his shoulder was hurt, and, and, and he felt numb on his arm. But you want to tell me intellectually how you ought to tackle. Ain't never tackle nothing. <laughs> Didn't even tackle your wife in the bedroom. Ain't never tackle nothing. <laughs> And you want to talk to somebody about how to make a towel. You have intellectually examined that, but you have no experience. So why intellectually talk to me about the love of God 
And you, you've never, you've never experienced it. You don't understand why a grown man can cry tears when you talk about knowing the love of God, but you don't understand he actually knows the love of God when he was a no good, hell raising, wife beating, lying cheat, and God took him and said, I love you and I'm gonna work with you. When I finish with you, I'm gonna make you the best husband that you thought you could never be. And when he hears this talk of knowing love, he can't hold his tears back, but you can because your intellectualism pumps you up in pride and say, yes, I know that. Yes, I know what three more scriptures are. Yes, I know the Greek of that. I'm not concerned about that no more. I'm tired of that. I want to meet some genuine Christians who delight in knowing their God experientially. I know 20 ways to get healed before midnight. You ain't never been sick before. You ain't never been told you're going to die before. I want to hear about your 20 ways to do it. I'm going to just talk to God. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask him, Lord, help me through this thing. I'm scared, Lord. Lord, if you could just lift me up and give me some encouragement right now, Lord. Lord, I don't know if this going to work, that going to work. Oh, Lord, help me, Jesus. Hallelujah. My faith don't seem like it's there. Could you give me my faith? Could you help me with my faith, Lord? I feel like I'm about to lose it right now. God, help me. And he comes in and gives you peace. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him. I want it. Christ to make his home in you. I don't want him to be a visitor in you. I want him to be a tenant occupying your heart. moved emotionally because you have no words to describe how much he means to you. And in the middle of a praise service, when the right song comes with the right words, and you start singing them, but you can't finish the song because you done got all choked up because you say, I know that God. He makes his home in your hearts and you trust him. Your roots will grow down into God's love. And he'll keep you strong. He'll keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide and how long and how high, how deep is his love. It's deeper than what some preachers say. It's deeper than what some apostles and bishops proclaim. As far as you can go loving somebody, God's love is deeper. I can't ever forgive my wife because she did this, did that. God, God's love goes deeper. This man killed my loved one. God's love goes deeper. When I did that interview with the man who adopted his son's killer, I just got convicted. And I said, help me, God. I don't think I can do that. And he said, not in your own human capacity, you can't. But this man didn't love in his human capacity. I drenched him with my supernatural love. 
And that was the only way he could adopt his son's killer. But God's love is even deeper than that. May you experience the love of Christ. Though it's too great to understand fully, I'm going to still let you experience it. I'm going to blow your mind with the experience. You, you may not be able to explain it to people, but I'm going I'm I'm to let you experience because I want you to know me. I want you to know it's not what you brought to the table. I want you to know it wasn't the 20 things you did right this week. I want you to know it wasn't because you were good, but because I'm good, I'm going to let you experience something beyond your human capacity. And then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Whew. Whoa. So, here is the, the emphasis on, you see the emphasis on a person and his love. It's not a matter of fulfilling commandments or obligations, not duties to perform nor even living up to the ideas and moral standards, Paul's desire was that Christ might dwell in your heart. Why the heart? Because the heart is the seat of your emotions which stir your whole being. This is what I'm talking about this morning. This is something in addition to intellectual knowledge. Notice I'm not beating up intellectual knowledge. I know it may sound like it, but I'm trying to exalt something a little bit higher so you can see. So this is in addition to intellectual knowledge of him. As important as that is, it is a realization of him as the controlling force of our own life. It's realizing him that becomes the controlling force of my whole life. It is a consciousness of oneness with him. It's him. It's him. The closest thing in human experience to that place that I'm talking about now is um, between a man and a woman. When this man meets this woman, the one he can't live without, and he becomes occupied thinking of her all the time. And that woman meets this man, and she becomes occupied. Oh, she thinks about his him wanting to be with him. He wanted to be with her. Where your love making is no longer just physical, but it moved into your spirit and soul, and you both begin to weep as you're making love with this person. The life of of neither is fully apart from the other. You just can't see life apart. That's what Paul said. I'll show it to you in a minute, but he said, for me to live is Christ. I can't see my life apart from him. When 
a man and a woman comes to that place, the each of them gives the other the preeminence. You're giving the other the, the strongest thing, the most important, the most powerful. When something is preeminent, it, it is surpassing all others. It's very distinguished in, this, in some way. It towers above. And that husband in your eyes towers above any man on the planet. And that wife in your eyes towers above any woman on the planet. And she may look better, and she may be finer, and she may talk three languages, but she cannot reach the level of intimacy and knowing. So this is what Paul saw. This is what Paul recognized. Here I am, a murdering Pharisee, a, a hypocrite, a religious traditional man who sat by while Stephen was stoned to death. I'm no good. I thought what I was doing was right. I was trying to keep the laws of the old covenant. And Jesus interrupted my life. And it wasn't what I read. I was, I was riding and I, I got interrupted and he showed up and I had an experience with Jesus. My whole life changed. And I told people about this Jesus. And I saw his glorious beauty. And all my time, I, all these people out and sent to heaven, I'm going to have to see one day. But Jesus came in and he released his marvelous grace. And he changed me from Saul to Paul. And now, to live is Christ. Christ dwells in the heart of the believer by faith. Life with all its acts and emotions becomes centered in him. And that's why the Holy Spirit is in this age, takes the things that are Christ and he makes them known to those who are his. He glorifies Christ so that he may become preeminent in the life of the believer. I get it, I get it. You're glorifying Christ. You're showing his greatness. You're showing, you're showing all of his might, all the things that he has done so that I can become the person that will say, you are Christ, my preeminent one. Look at what you've done. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7, 8, and 10. Philippians 3, 7, 8, and 10. In the King James, let's go there. But what things were gained to me, Paul said, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, verse 10, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering and being made conformable unto his death. Let's go to NLT, starting at verse 7. I once thought these things were valuable. Who I did. I thought being approved of everybody was valuable. I thought being accepted was valuable. I thought somebody shouting amen when I preached was valuable. I, I thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless 
because of what Christ has done. Yeah. I thought my teaching on the tabernacle and understanding the law of Moses was valuable until I experienced what Christ, experienced what Christ has done. I'm not the same, and I'm so glad. Verse 8, yes, everything else is worthless. <laughs> everything else is worthless. When I compare it with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, everything's worthless. He's preeminent. Seriously, what, 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 what can stand up to that? Everything's worthless. All your material stuff is worthless. All your reputation stuff is worthless. All your fame is worthless. All of it's worthless. What somebody thinks about you, the validation, all of it's worthless. Who like you, who don't like you, all of it's worthless. Who calls you, who checks on you, all of it's worthless. When compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for his sake I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so I could gain Christ. I want to know Christ. I want to experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead because this power of love is transformative power. Is that power so I can have a prayer line and show you how powerful I am? Is that powerful so I can say, I'm anointed, give me the money, and then you'll get it too? No, it's the power of transforming, transforming myself from the junk I was to the magnificence of what his glory can can, can complete in me. I want to know Christ. And I know a lot of Christians that are not really wanting to know him. They're okay with just knowing about him. I want to know Christ. You know what I prayed this morning? I was talking to the Lord this morning, and I was talking to the Lord, and I, and I just stopped. I said, there is so much I don't know. So if I don't stick with you, not that I'm going to know it all on my days on earth, there's so much I don't know. And there's so much people think they know. No, you think you know exactly what's going to happen when you leave your body. You don't have a clue. How magnificent that's going to be. If you did, you could hardly even stay here. You would be in a line trying to walk out on Old National in front of the next bus that came by. I want to know Christ. And I want to experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him and in sharing in his death. What was that like? I want to know him. I want to know him. It took me 42 years to finally get the right teaching. I've said it before. But why did Paul give up these things? Not because he didn't have a right to enjoy them, but for the same reason that he, that, he, that he might win Christ. Not as his Savior, but as his all. See, I was satisfied with Christ as my Savior. Not just my Savior, but my all. One infinitely greater and more precious than everything in the world 
had captivated the soul of Paul. And even in Luke chapter 5, verse 11, turn there, Luke 5, 11 in the, in the NLT, well, the KJ, KJ and then NLT, they had gathered all of this fish. Boats were sinking, nets were breaking. Prosperity hit them in that day. You would think, let's gather it up, let's go home. We done made it. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. The NLT says this. <laughs> and as soon as they landed, they left everything and followed Jesus. I wonder how many of you, a billion dollars has fallen into your, excuse me for yelling, some of y'all jumped, I, I apologize. I, I just, I'm so super excited, okay? Okay, a billion dollars <laughs> has just been transferred into your account. And Jesus is over here and saying, come go with me. Leave everything. I wonder how many of you will follow Jesus. Don't lie to the Lord, because he already know. <laughs> he already know that that is the biggest temptation of your whole life. But what you don't get is you're going to stay there with the fruit instead of following the source. Ain't no problem seeing nothing like that again because the source is in your life. And that's your problem. You settle for what you can see and what you can have, and you don't realize that all good things come from God. Let me, let me close. To please his Lord was Paul's greatest desire. It completely possessed his entire being. His whole life was directly related to Christ. Philippians 1.24, his whole life was related to Christ. To live. Philippians 1.21, excuse me. To live is Christ. That's his whole life. Wonder will that become our whole lives? He says, for to live is Christ and to die. He says, this is a game. Because when you make your whole life Christ, and then when you die, you get to be with him. Oh, my goodness. It cannot be a mere coincidence that to Paul, more than to any other man, God had revealed the exceeding riches of his grace and that it was first given to him to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. And in the life of Paul is seen, as in no other person, the fullest effort of the grace of God. How God changed him. Beholding Christ and his glory transforms the life of every believer. And in beholding Christ, you become occupied with him. You become occupied with his beauty. You become occupied with his grace. And that, ladies and gentlemen, produces liberty and conformity to his image. Someone said, to be occupied with self is despair. But to be occupied with Christ is glory. I, I'm sure I'm not finished with this teaching. I, I don't know if you can take no more, so I need to close it. Because some of you are really in there. And you don't fell asleep. <laughs> Jeez. 
yes, Jesus. Oh, yes. I want to know you. But can I know you while I'm sleeping? You said you give to your beloved sweet sleep. Give it, give it to me while I'm asleep, Lord. <laughs> give it to me while I'm asleep. You see how much more this is? This is so much more than what we... And now you see why it's a personal relationship? Can't nobody do this but you and him. Prepare yourself for the days to come and the Holy Spirit moving in your life is near. And your enemy as always will be prepared to confront you with fear. But these are precious times that I've had confidence in you. And I pray that through your endeavors, you have faith in me too. For I have dwelt in you and known you even before you were born here. And I understand all that will be done with you as the time closes and draws near. For men will be waddling in their chaos, in confusion it'll be. But as you get to know me, great exploits you'll see. For I am your God, throughout all of these generations to come. <laughs> and all of you who hear my voice and experience my love, I'll bring you from the depths of struggle, the hunger for peace, I'll bring you into a place where you will understand great mysteries. And the day will come that with lifted hands you will rejoice of me for this glory that you have heard spoken of. Starting this week, you will see And as you spend time with me in prayer and fellowship for all of the bounty of this day, the power that many hunger after, <laughs> all of those wicked desires will soon move away. There will be great joy that will rise up on the inside of you, you see. <laughs> great love because you understand the power is of me. So all of the fables that have entertained you over the years, it was Satan's plan to inject into your life many of these awful fears. So, rejoice, I say, on a daily basis as I begin to plot out your ways. For I say it with definition that these are the last days.
in my presence, you will know <laughs> how amazing life can be. Again, I say to you, don't wait. Rejoice, and you'll see. But many cynics have walked and come into this land. Their assignment towards you is to destroy my anointed plan. But I'm with you and even in you, and we'll get the job done. And man, when it's all over and you're with me, you're going to say, boy, that was fun. <laughs> Our God is an awesome God. You've heard it declared in this earth. His precious power, his awesome love. Let's rejoice for he is our God. Thus saith the Spirit of the Lord. Well, rejoice. Rejoice. That's got to be the sorriest rejoice thing I've ever seen before in my life. I mean to tell you. Come on, do it by faith. Do it by faith. Rejoice by faith. Rejoice by faith. Rebosha telelebedo robo reban. Hallelujah. Well, let's go ahead and and give. I said, let's go ahead and give. Give unto the Lord, watch this, glory. Do unto his name. Well, how do we do that, Lord? Bring an offering and worship him in the beauty of his holiness. Praise God. If you need an offering envelope, ushers, if you'll raise your hands, they'll get one to you. Uh, yeah, man, your life ain't going to never be the same again. But to know him, to experience him, and experience his love, Yeah. Yeah, you know that's right. Experience his love. And with everything you know you need to do, don't forget to ask God to help you do it. Oh, God, I need to pray. Oh, Lord, help me to pray. Oh, Lord, I need to forgive. But, but no, but, no, Lord, help me to forgive. It ain't nothing you and God can't accomplish. Just acknowledge his greatness. Acknowledge him. His presence is going to get stronger and stronger when you by yourself. Not just the presence you feel when you come to church, but it's going to get stronger when you by yourself. Be careful when you wash the dishes. <laughs> Watch out when you're vacuuming. Keep your eyes open while you're driving. Because he wants to know you and you want to know him. And this thing's going to come together, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I love y'all. Praise God. God is good. Mm. Oh, my goodness. 
something like that. I want to preach again and again. I just might do it. One time I preached the same message for a whole month, and the church said, well, I really like this one. I'm like, I preached the same thing I preached last week. <laughs> you must have been asleep. <laughs> said, yeah, but pastor, the Lord gave me something in my dream. Oh, what did he give you? Well, I don't know. Well, I mean, that was just a wasted sleep. You didn't get nothing. <laughs> Amen. Hold your offerings up. Let's believe God. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to, to, give, to give glory due to your name, to bring an offering not from pressure, but from our hearts, to give because we want to, not because we fear, not out of necessity, but a cheerful giver. And we praise you for this now. Take this seed, grow it wherever you need for it to grow. And we praise you for it in Jesus' name. Everybody say it, amen. amen. Ushers, go ahead and receive the offering. <clears throat> now, if you're here and you, you <clears throat> if you're here this morning and you haven't been born again and you want to get born again, then make your way on down here. We want to pray with you. If you're here and you want to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, make your way on down here. We want to pray with you. <clears throat> if you're here this morning and um, you want to reconnect with your relationship with Jesus, let's do it. We'll show you how. And last but not least, if God's calling you to join this church, World Changes Church International today, then I want you to go do it. I believe I don't have to keep nagging somebody to do something that they want to do. If you want to do it, you'll do it. Amen? And then if you don't, you don't. And then and, and we'll just keep praying and God will work on you. Be fine. So if that's you, if you're not saved, come on down. You want to reconnect? Come on down. You want the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Come on down. You want to join the church? Come on down. I need thee, oh, I need thee every hour. I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to to thee. I need thee, oh, I need thee every hour. I need thee, oh, bless me now, my I come to to me. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Come on, one more time, Amazing Grace. Sing it now. You know it's amazing. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. That's 
Some of y'all don't know nothing about that, but I'm telling you, glory be to God. Hallelujah. I'm going to stay on the battlefield. I'm going to stay on the battlefield. I'm going to stay on. I dare you to give him some praise. I dare you to give him a praise. Father, I pray for those who come to this altar. Remove every burden. Destroy every yoke. Mm. Get on them, Lord. Lead them and guide them. Melt away their sorrows and their pain. Be their God. In Jesus' name, amen. You precious people, if you'll turn this way and follow this gentleman to the prayer room, they're going to take you and they're going to minister to you and give you biblical understanding of how to obtain and maintain what you can receive. You'll never be the same again. If you'll stand for our final blessing, thank you guys so much for coming to church today. Now unto him, the spirit of grace, who walks with us and guides and protects us. I pray divine protection over you and your family. I pray the blessings of God will overtake you. I pray that the peace of God will reside in your heart all week long and that the Holy Spirit of God will lead you all the days of your life. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the Almighty God, 
be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. And everybody said, God bless you. Have a great day today. Look, taking it in, taking it in, taking it in. Service, service was amazing. It just hit me. I know I'm supposed to be talking. I'm trying not to cry right now. <laughs> Ooh, praise God. Yes. It was so yeah, powerful yeah, yeah. Yeah. and impactful to sit and hear a message that stirs your craving to yeah. know God. Yeah. Wow. What was the takeaway that you took? So oh, for great. me, oh my goodness, when he said that the Holy Spirit's job is to show us the very essence, the glory of who God is, the more that the Holy Spirit shows God to us, he becomes the preeminent one. He Absolutely. becomes the one that sits on top. Absolutely. He's the one that comes first. It's We're not looking like God plus anybody. It's literally God. And like you say, we become more hungry for him. Absolutely. We're searching him, seeking him. We want to know who God is and include him in everything that we do. That is like the biggest takeaway I got. What did you get from That's Alicia? amazing. One of the things I took away is he said he wasn't throwing away the intellectual. Yeah. But if you're going to get a revelation about anything, make sure you're getting a revelation yeah. about the love of God yeah, yeah, yeah. for you. Yeah. Us having a revelation of how much God loves us. That it's not just about, I can quote this scripture, I know the address yeah. for where it is in the Bible, but God loves loves me even on my worst day. God yeah. loves yeah. me even on my best day. God loves me. I'm, I'm telling you, it was such an impactful word. That's why I'm like trying not yeah. to weep. It, it sat in my spirit yeah. and not just in my yeah. mind. Yeah. yeah. And then just how I know we supposed to just be moving on, <laughs> but just let's stay here for a second. Even how Pastor Dollar ended service with the prophetic word and then closing out with a prayer, closing out with a song. It's just like putting a stamp on everything that we learn. All the things that we got in it's almost like it was like oh this this church was good today Absolutely. church was good today and, and speaking of church being good today we had the opportunity to be here yes. and those of you who are online you were tapped into it as well and so we also want to give you an opportunity to get yes. with us so if you didn't see it on the screen yet and you're you're just tuning in or you're tuning in and you were so caught up in the <laughs> word you didn't get a chance to get the information we want to encourage you to give and sow from a place of love For Today. Sure. Grace, would you like to tell them the ways that they can give? So, to give, y'all already know, we have four ways to give. So, it's not no excuse. Make sure you get your seed in the ground. Let yeah. it work for you. So, first, you can text World Changers and leave a space and add your amount to 74483. You can call us at 866-477-7683. You can Email, I'm sorry, not email us, Lord. You could send it to it in the mail, 2500 Burdett Road, College Park, Georgia, 30349. Or you can go online at worldchangers.org or creflodollarministries.org. So make sure you get that seed Absolutely. in the ground. So, Felicia, what we got going so on? So this is a, the next thing I was thinking of, too. I'm super excited. Those of you who are in Los Angeles, maybe you tune in online from L.A. or you're in the Los Angeles area or near it, get it ready because Dr. Dollar is coming to LA February 2nd, 2024 with the ex the Change Experience yes. 2024 for two sessions that's going to help you move to the next stage on your journey of change. So register today and also invite a friend, bring some family and loved ones out to it and join us in LA. Text CHANGE 2024 that's c-h-a-n-g-e 2024 to 51555 or log on to creflo dollar ministries to reserve your spot today and we'll see you in la yes so you already know this is probably one of my favorite times of the year it's yes. christmas <laughs> not only is it christmas it's new year's so world changers we want to invite you guys come home for christmas join us on sunday uh december the 24th at 10 a.m for our annual christmas celebration Celebration. We are having some awesome surprises in store, so do not miss it. Come home for yes. Christmas for WCCI this season. And then join us for our New Year's Eve service happening on Sunday, December 31st at 7 p.m. We are going to have amazing surprises. You do not want to miss it. If you can, be in the building. Come, come early yes. so you can get your 
feet, push through, and we would love to see you for this holiday season. Absolutely. And calling all ladies of World Changers ladies. for 2024. Get ready to bloom with Radical Women's Conference 2024. You're invited to join Pastor Taffy Dollar, Laura Pickett, Chrislyn McNair, Dr. Anita Phillips, yes. Samara Joy, yes. and more for two powerful days all about confidently reaching the heights of your potential. We said confidently, confidently. reaching the heights <laughs> of your potential. So don't miss out on this time of fellowship with other amazing women of God and people of God who are going to gather to worship in this fulfilling time. So to register, it's super important that you go ahead and register so you can be counted. Uh, text RADICAL to 51555 or visit taffydollar.org and save your spot today. If you know you're bringing people with you, go ahead and get the tickets yes, now and yes. then sow them later to whoever you yes, want to bring. Yes, yes. Pastor Dollar talked about that spirit of procrastination. So don't wait. Make sure you register today. Absolutely. So we just want to close out. Yes. We love you. We love you. The, and and uh, go another ahead. thing, if you want to stay up to date on the events or yes. maybe we were giving the announcements, you didn't get a chance to write it down, visit World worldchangers.org and you can find all of the information there. Yes. Dr. Dollar said this uh, when he was speaking, getting a word from the Lord, uh, that it's going to start as early as this week. Yes. So we're about to step into a glory week. Yes. We're about to cross over into a threshold of glory and what we have to do, walk in love and expect yeah. to see God's love showing up for us Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday love. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we're yes. so excited. Yes. Thank you all for joining us. We love you, and we will see you next week. Bye. Bye. Have a good one.